who's singing? Brother Patrick, you're singing? All right, come ahead, brother. And uh, after he sings, we'll have a message for you. soul of man never dies. Open your Bibles please to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. We're going to read three verses there and uh, as we think about these three verses that we read in chapter 12, I want you to think back about what the content of chapter 11 is. Chapter 11 we sometimes call the heroes hall of faith. All of those faithful people from the past, past Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, Samson, and many of, the, many of the heroes of the faith are mentioned in chapter 11, and <coughs> excuse me, it says also in chapter 11, but without faith it is impossible to please him. So if we're going to please God, we need faith, and if we're going to be joyful in this Christian life, we ought to have faith, because it takes faith or you can't be happy. The reason a lot of people are not happy in their Christian life is because they don't have much faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Isn't that a good reason to come to church? You come to church because you hear the Word of God and the Bible specifically, plainly, says that 
faith is increased by hearing the Word of God. And as you hear the promises of God, it's easier to be happy in a world that's filled with confusion, a world that's filled with doubts, a world that's filled with, uh, filled with fears. And uh, if you've got faith, then you know that God is going to take care of you through it all. And, and the circumstances around you won't matter near as much. But we live in a time where people are, people are seeing psychiatrists and counselors and taking pills and looking under every rock to try to, find, try to find happiness and to be cheered up and encouraged. And I want to just tell you that when you, when you go to the Word of God, you have the source of blessing. You have the source of encouragement. And so I want to preach today about that subject. We're going to read in chapter 12 the first three verses, and then we're going to preach on the subject, listen to the cheering section. Listen to the cheering section. We want to welcome those who are watching by way of Internet on the live stream. We thank you for tuning in with us. And some are listening later on sermon audio, and we appreciate all those. We have a good outreach through that. And today, we want to be a help to you from the Word of God. In chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, we're thinking about those heroes of the faith. And then we read in verse 1. Wherefore, having just read what's in chapter 11 about the heroes. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are the witnesses? Well, a bunch of them are mentioned in... Hebrews chapter 11. They're witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. The word beset means to hinder, to hold back, to stumble, to make you fall, to hinder you. The sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus. I wish we could get that deep down in our soul. Looking unto Jesus, not looking at man, not looking at those around you, not looking at government, not looking at anything else, but for our cheerful attitude and joy of life, we look unto whom? Jesus, it's Him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? Faith, let's say it together, it's faith. <laughs> That's where we get our joy, faith by looking at Jesus, not looking inside. Can I just caution you about something right here? A lot of people spend hours and hours and hours looking inside themselves, trying to find joy and contentment and peace. But if you believe what the Bible says, the Bible teaches that every last one of us are sinners who don't even deserve to go to heaven in the first place. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. If we could have found anything good inside, then God would have said, well, do the best you can, and you'll get there. No, we needed a Savior. And, uh, and you'll never find joy and peace by looking inside, because what you find when you look inside is just a dirty, old, smutty sinner. And, uh, and so when we look inside, we're going to be discouraged. But when we look to Jesus, the perfect Son of God, we can be encouraged. Now, look at... Uh, Look at the last part of it. Or let's read verse 2 again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now watch this, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us, encourage us. Lord, help us to think upon the cheering section of heaven today. And I pray that it would encourage our hearts and help us to lay aside the things that would weight us down and discourage us. And Lord, I pray for the children of God today that they would see what they have to look forward to and uh, what we can be encouraged about right now. And Lord, for those who don't know Jesus as Savior, that they would see in us, but especially in the Word of God, that which is perfect, the Son of God, who can cleanse their soul and save it and give them an eternal home in heaven. I pray you'd bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Listen to the cheering section. It was 15 years ago. My wife and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. 
Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not our 50th wedding anniversary. 50th birthday. Man, when we're not that old. <laughs> Got to get this straight. 50th birthday. And uh, my sister had called up and said, uh, we would, said, I would like to meet you and your wife at Batesville at Catfish Wharf, a big catfish house there in Batesville. And she said, I'd uh, like to meet you there and, uh, and just have supper with you. I don't ever get to see y'all much. And since your birthday's coming up, I'd just like to, I'd like to meet y'all and, and have supper with you. And I tried to weasel out of it, but she wouldn't let me. And she made me promise that I'd be there at a certain time. And uh, so when I got there, we were escorted. My wife and I were escorted through the building. We went through different rooms in the building. They've got different areas of dining. And we went through all those. There was plenty of seating out there. I didn't understand why we weren't being seated there. Went through those places and all the way to a back room and large room, probably as big as this, uh, as big as this art auditorium. And uh, and when we stepped through the door, pushed the doors open, and uh, just as we stepped through, the greatest amount of cheering broke out that you ever heard. And I tried to turn and push my wife back out. I went in the wrong room. <laughs> and and uh, my sister said, "No, wait, wait, go back in here." And so we went in. And as I began to look around, the light wasn't real bright. I looked around and I began to see people from our old church where, where we'd both gotten saved and baptized and, and I'd gotten uh, my call to preach and I began to see some of those people. I began to see some people that I'd grown up with when I was a little kid and, uh, and then began to see some people from our own church and, and, uh, and recognize all these people and I'm scratching my head thinking, why are all these people? It's an odd, you know, that you see this many people that you know in the same room, in the same town, in the same restaurant, and uh, they're all still cheering and clapping. And, and my sister Cheryl said, you're dense, aren't you? <laughs> she said, it's your birth surprise birthday party. We're celebrating. And so I said, oh, okay, I get it. And uh, boy, we had a marvelous time. Celebration. We were encouraged. That was back in the days when we were just getting started. Our church was three years old, and uh, we were just getting started. And, uh, and that was such an encouragement to cheer us on. And I, and I was thinking about this passage of Scripture for the, for the Christians who become discouraged in this life, maybe meet some hardships. Things are not going real good. And, uh, and somehow, all of a sudden, you hear some cheers from a crowd that's cheering you on, saying, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go. You've got a cheering section just for you. Do you know everybody in here, if you're a born-again child of God, you've got a cheering section. And I want to preach to you today about this cheering section. This is a figure of speech used in this passage. These three verses we read in chapter 12, there's this figure of speech here, uh, the race that is set before us. The race. And uh, it is a picture of the, the present Christians who are in this Christian race. We're, we're on our way. Uh, we're on our way to the Lord's final destination for us. But we have this life to live out first. And, uh, and this is not heaven uh, on earth. You figured that out, haven't you? <laughs> We're not in heaven. Some people say, well, I, I certainly won't go to hell. I've already served my hell here on earth. That's not true either, friend. There is a real hell. There's a burning hell. And there is a real heaven where there'll be no sin and no sorrow. But we're not there to either place yet. And so we're living this life and it's compared to a race. And this race is one that each of us is in. Now, these people over in chapter 11, those heroes have finished their race. And what you do is when you finish the race, you finish your race, you, you're on the sidelines looking at the racetrack, and you're cheering on your fellow man. You're trying to cheer the others on that's still in the race. And that's what Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Samson and Moses and all these other guys and Daniel and all of those uh, Old Testament heroes, they're cheering us on. You say, do you believe people in heaven can see what we're doing here on earth? I don't know how much the Lord allows them to see, but I do know that the Bible says that we are compassed about. That means we are surrounded by witnesses. Now, whether they can see every single thing we do or not, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But since they're called witnesses, I don't think they're just, they were witnesses in the past tense that they just witnessed of God in their time I believe that the, the present tense there that they are witnesses now uh, 
Jesus said that, that God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And so uh, he's, he's intimating to us that there is a cloud of witnesses. And he says because of that cloud of witnesses, we ought to be aware that there's some cheering going on. Now, who are the witnesses? Uh, thinking about this foot race, if you look, uh, look down at chapter 11 just for a moment for give you a couple of points here. In chapter 11, verse number 33, it says of these heroes, and they're only heroes because God empowered them. They're not heroes in their own right. They had faith. They had their faith in the right place. Verse 33 says, Who, the heroes, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. Anybody here ever feel weak? Watch how these people were treated. Now these are the ones that's hailed and cheered as heroes in chapter 11. Watch, watch a little bit more about them. They waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of, a, of the aliens. Women also received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured. Uh-oh. And it sounded like everything's going good there for a while. And he says some of them were tortured. Not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom this world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us should not be made perfect. Now, I want to show you just a few things. You can probably identify with some of those things they're talking about. I don't think anybody in here has probably ever been sawn asunder. If you've ever read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll find out that, that Christians in the past have truly been persecuted and tortured. Many burned at the stake as the flames licked up around their bodies. That Many of them would sing hymns of faith as they burned to their death. Some were laid on a rack and stretched by their hands and their feet until their, their bones were pulled out of joint. Some were laid on a table and alive had a crosscut saw and sawn half in two while they're still alive. Some were skinned like a dead animal, only they were skinned while they were alive. Now, sometimes Christians go through some terrible persecutions. That's those of the past. So that, if that does one good thing for us, it ought to make us think that maybe our persecutions are not all that bad. <laughs> but we do have some difficulties in our lives. And that's what I want to try to encourage you about. Let me give you the first point. The Christian life is a battle. The Christian life is a battle. And that's what we just read about in Hebrews chapter 11. It's a battle. Old Lester Roloff, an old evangelist of, uh, of the past, he died in an airplane crash in 1982, the year I went to Bible college. Lester Roloff used to have a saying, and, uh, and when he was preaching, he was preaching about the way Christians ought to, be, uh, ought to be tough, and Christians ought to stand for what's right, and Christians ought to stand against sin, and Christians be tough and, and endure and be good soldiers of the faith. And he would say this. He'd say, Brother, the Christian life is not a recreation hall. It's a battlefield. <laughs> it's a battlefield. What's some of the battles that we see in this race? We're going back to chapter 12 now, verses 1 through 3. He says that we are, that we are in a race. We're in a race. We, we've got a course to finish. You with me on that? We have a course to finish. Everybody who is saved has a course to finish. God has a will for your life. He has a purpose. And you may not see it from, in, from, from start to end, from start to finish, but God does. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so sometimes you just have to discover one step at a time. But if you'll just stay on the path, he'll show you the next step. And we're in a race. And uh, 
when in these these arenas back in Bible times, one of the sports that was so popular was that they would put Christians in an arena and then turn loose the wild animals, lions, tigers, beasts. And we're in a we're in a race. Those Christians in those days faced some literal beasts of lions that had real claws and real teeth and ate them up. Now, thank God we don't have that in America right now. Uh, depending on who you decide to vote for <laughs> in the election, you're supposed to lighten up a little bit. Just relax, all right? I know Brother, Brother Paul got some of you all stirred up in the Sunday school hour. <laughs> it could get worse. But Christian life is a battle. And while we might not meet the beasts of lions and tigers, we do meet beasts in our life. Let me just tell you some of the beasts that you face. You'll recognize them. What about the beast of habits? Bad habits. Keeps you from having encouragement and joy in your life because some bad habits just kind of wrap it. They just wrap their arms around you. Maybe, you're, maybe your habit is you can't get out of bed in the morning. You've got to hit the snooze alarm ten times and you're late for work. Maybe your habit is tobacco and, uh, and it's eating on your lungs. You say, do you really think... Would, would smoking send anybody to hell? No, but it'll make you smell like you've been there. And uh, <clears throat> drinking. Some people got drugs and drinking and, and sometimes illegal or legal drugs and they wrap their arms around. So the, the habits can steal your joy and you need to be encouraged again. The world, the world around us. I mean, this old world is a sorry place in a lot of ways. I mean, it's beautiful and it's still has a, a, a wonderful resemblance of God's original creation and some of the mountains and the oceans and beauty and the, and the outer space and all that we can see, the stars and heavenly uh, bodies and outer space. It's all a beautiful thing, but this whole world is a, is a pretty sorry place in a lot of ways. It's a cruel place in a lot of ways. And the world, the world system, will try to wrap you into its sway. The world says, you've got to go our way. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking about politics. And I don't mind talking about politics in the pulpit because my religion affects every part of my life. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it ought to, if your religion is not strong enough <laughs> to influence where you go and who you hang out with and what kind of books you read and what kind of movies you watch and what kind of politician you vote for, if your religion doesn't do that, then your religion's not very strong. And, uh, and I understand that this old world says to the politicians, hey, you say whatever you got to say to get elected, and then when you get up here in D.C., then you'll see how things really work, and you got to go our way. The world says go our way. And that's why you better, hey, if all the good old boys in D.C. is four-year candidate, you better turn around and look for somebody else. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yeah. Habits are beasts, the world is beast, uh, the flesh is a beast, the flesh has its cravings and it cries out like a spoiled brat and wants to have its way in your life. I've dealt with Christians in counseling situations over my 30 some odd years of ministry and I've, I've dealt with some people uh, that have been involved in some of the most awful sins that I can't even talk about in mixed company. That bad that bad and I know I've seen people taken right out of church and become enmeshed in the most awful sins that's imaginable horrible things that the world don't even talk about publicly and it can happen to anybody there's beasts that are looking for you there's beasts that are trying to grab you and snatch you out of the race and you don't have joy when you're in the clutches of the beast does that make sense <coughs> and then you got the devil the devil's real. He's not some guy in a little red union suit with a pointy tail and a pitchfork going around jabbing people, but he's real, and he's more real than that little red man in the suit. The devil is real, and he's out to get you. He hates your guts. 
The Bible says that the devil was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And whenever you get crossways with somebody else in your family or in your church, it just might be that the devil stuck his dirty nose in there and got you that way. There's people who've given up on church because of some unfortunate circumstances. Some of you out there listening on the internet might be one of these. And I, I thank God you're watching, but I'm going to tell you the truth. If you quit church because you think you can stay home and watch it on TV or on the internet and not be involved in a local Bible preaching church, now if you're housebound and your, your health won't let you get out, I understand. But if you just got mad at somebody in church one time and somebody didn't treat you right in some church and you said, that's it, I'm not going to church anymore, they're all bad. Well, in the first place, if you, if you presume to know that all churches are bad, then you're claiming omniscience which belongs only to God. He's the only one that knows about every church on the face of the planet. And all churches are not bad. The church was created by Jesus Christ and he is the head of it. And to short circuit the church and say, I'm not going to church anymore because somebody hurt my itty bitty feelings is an excuse. Billy Sunday, the old evangelist from uh, a century ago said, <coughs> a, uh, an excuse is just a, a skin of truth stuffed with a lie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know people that won't go to church anymore. They say, well, I got my feelings hurt one time. They're not going back. And they're, they're not very joyful because somebody stole their joy back there. Well, let me ask you something. Did you ever get your feelings hurt? Did you ever get mad at somebody at a restaurant? Have you quit going there? Did you ever get, you ever get mistreated at a grocery store? Ever get your coupons denied? <laughs> Have you quit buying groceries? Have you decided to quit eating? Did you ever get, did you ever drink some water that didn't have a good taste? Did you quit drinking water because of it? Did you ever get a bad haircut or a bad hairdo at the barber or the hairdresser? Did you decide to quit getting your haircut because of that? Uh, my brother-in-law had a, he had a good story. My brother-in-law that passed away with a brain tumor a few years ago, he said he went to his barber up at Melbourne and he said, uh, he said I sat down in the chair and the barber said, uh, how do you want it cut? He said, well, I want, a, I, want, uh, I want all of it cut off of this side and leave this side kind of gapped up and then cut a, out of the top of it, cut a little space about as big as a silver dollar and, uh, and then just kind of zigzag through the back of it. He said, man, I can't do that. He said, well, you did the last time I was here. <laughs> now, I'm just saying, if you ever got a bad haircut, you still might need a haircut again someday. If you ever went to church and somebody mistreated you, somebody didn't shake your hand, somebody ignored you, you didn't get the recognition you needed, and somehow you didn't get soothed and, and you just couldn't stay put, and so you just said, I'm going to quit going to church. Are you really justified in saying that? No. And you won't find joy that way, just getting uh, mad at people and dropping out because of it you end up being the loser. And then there's a beast of weights. Look at it again there in uh, chapter 12, verse number 1. He said, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now remember, we're trying to find out how to get rid of the things that's stealing our joy and, and listen to the cheerleaders uh, that's cheering us on. Lay aside every weight. There's uh, the beast of weights. Discouragement can come from so many different directions. Uh, circumstances, family, finances, health, loneliness, depression, character flaws. All of those things can, can steal your joy. <laughs> so you have to get loud. Well, Brother Tidwell can't hear good. And he told Johnny Long uh, a few years ago when Johnny Long was here, Johnny didn't preach very loud. And Tidwell said to, to Long, he said, Hey, man, he, he, now you've got to understand, Johnny Long's uh, way up in his set. He may be 80 by now. I don't know. <laughs> He's about 80 years old. And Brother Tidwell said to Brother Long, he said, if you're ever going to make a preacher, you're going to have to start speaking up where I can hear you. <laughs> so, I'm trying to make sure he hears me. And so if it's too loud for you, just, uh, well, just, it'll be okay. <laughs> Your burdens and weights. Sometimes you get weighted down. Now listen to me. Listen, I'm trying to help you with something here. Too many Christians don't get involved in their Christian life and they just live like a secular individual instead of a Christian. I don't doubt that you've come to the place in your life where you accepted Christ as your Savior. But I know that the, that the weights can get so heavy that you're just existing and you may just show up for church just to put in your time. <laughs> kind of like a prison sentence. Huh? If you go to church feeling like, well, I've got to go and take my beating, man, <laughs> you have a bad attitude towards church. You know? 
I had somebody say that one time. They said, well, I guess I've got to go to church Sunday and take my beating. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not that way. So, shouldn't we have joy in our Christian life? I was reading just a couple of days ago, uh, Brother Paul was talking about in, in Bible study this morning about reading through your Bible. And uh, you ever get kind of bogged down a little bit in Leviticus? Numbers? Numbers, yeah. You think, man, this sounds so repetitious, and I don't know if there's anything really. You know what I got out of Numbers this week? <coughs> I thought God's a God of order. <laughs> God set these people over this and set those people over that and these people over that, and these offerings are supposed to be this way and those offerings. And that helps me to see that God expects orderliness. And, uh, and then as, as I was reading through there, and a lot of it is repetitive, but aren't you glad you live in an age of grace instead of under the Moses, Moses law? <laughs> uh, man. Thank God for that. But I was reading about the, uh, the Levites in uh, Numbers. Let me, let me read it to you. In, in Numbers chapter uh, 7, listen to this. Numbers chapter 7 and verse 6. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them unto the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen. Now notice this is important. Here's one group of the Levites, the priestly order that was to serve the tabernacle and move it when, it, when they were traveling. And so he, it says that this one group gets... Uh, they get wagons and oxen. It says two wagons and four oxen. And he gave unto the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. Now watch this in verse 9. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging to them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. Hey, listen to me. Here's these two groups. This one group, they get, when they get ready to move the tabernacle through the wilderness, they've got two wagons and oxen to move their stuff on, and they just walk around with their hands in their pockets while the oxen are pulling the load. And another group of them, their load of the tabernacle that's being moved, they've got four wagons and eight oxen. And they're walking along, whistling with their hands in their pocket, just following those oxen along, pulling their load. But those poor old Kohathites. The Kohathites. He said he didn't give them any oxen. They didn't get any wagons. They have to carry their stuff with poles stuck through it on their shoulders and bear the burden of the weight of their part of the load on their own shoulders. Well, that's, that stinks, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, isn't God unfair? <laughs> no, God knows what he's doing. Those people, you know what they were doing? Now, you and I might look at it and say, you know, that just really doesn't seem right that the Kohathites had to carry that stuff. You know what they were carrying? They were carrying a precious cargo. They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant where, and the mercy seat where the presence of God would show up in that tabernacle. And they were carrying something so precious that they couldn't trust it to oxen and wagons. They carried it on their own shoulders. Was it heavy? Yeah. Was it laborious? Yeah. We're going through the desert. And I was thinking about people today in the Christian life. A lot of times people are carrying heavy burdens, and maybe it's with your health, maybe it's with your finances, maybe it's with family. You're carrying heavy burdens, and you're struggling with, with something on your shoulders that, that just kind of makes your knees wobble, and you don't know if you're going to be able to take another step or not. But, you know, God knows who He can trust with precious burdens. And it might be you're carrying something that's very, very precious to God, and He didn't give you a wagon to carry it in. He gave you your shoulders. Think about that. Instead of criticizing God who knows everything, why don't we just say, you know, if God meant for me to carry this burden, I'm just going to kind of strengthen the knees and the shoulders and take another step. Well, let me move to number two. The Christian does not fight alone. Now here, here we're getting down to the thing I really want to get to, the main idea. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the Christian... He goes through all these weights and labors. And look here, he's going through all these trials and tribulations in life, and everybody has them. You just don't know what other people are carrying. Somebody's carrying some heavy burdens right around you, and they're smiling. You think, man, they've got it made. You don't know what they're carrying. The Christian does not fight alone, though. Look at verse number 1 again with me in chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The witnesses. Who are the witnesses? Who's in heaven? Look here. Who's in heaven looking over the banisters of heaven? Who's there? 
Well, one group that's there is the group of angels. We know the angels live in heaven. Isn't that right? There's angels up there and they're watching. And the Bible says that sometimes we entertain angels unawares. And so there's that group that's cheering us on, the angels up there, and they're watching what we're doing. And uh, well, just let me give a couple examples of, of the angels. You remember in the Garden of Eden when God cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden? And, uh, and I heard a little boy in Sunday school class, the teacher had him draw pictures, and he drew a picture of a convertible and this hairy, uh, white-headed man, hairy, white-headed man driving this convertible. And he had a man and a woman in the back seat. And the teacher said, what is that? She, he said, that's God driving Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> you know, it's the way we see things, right? And uh, but God drove Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and what did he put there at the gate to keep them from going back in? Two cherubim, one on each side with flaming swords. He said, that sounds like a bad thing. Well, they had already blown that opportunity that they had in the Garden of Eden. And they couldn't go back. And so the angels are there watching them. You know what a lot of people are doing? A lot of people are living in the past. And there's something happened in your past. And, and it's not anything you can change. Are you listening? If you've got something you've done wrong in the past, then try to fix it. But there's some things that, that you can't fix. You can't go back and fix some things. And instead of living in the past and letting, letting defeat take your soul and, uh, and letting discouragement be a constant cloud over your head, realize that it's good that you can't go back because you'd probably mess up again. Go forward. Here's what, here's what uh, the Apostle Paul said. He said in Philippians 3.10, he said that I may know Him, Jesus, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Now listen to this. In verse 11, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count my, not, myself not to have apprehended, but this the one thing I do. What one thing? Forgetting those things which are behind. <laughs> and reaching forth unto those things which are before. There comes a time in life when you look at that thing back there in the past that keeps you discouraged and you say, I don't know what to do about it. Then move on. <laughs> say, like the Apostle Paul, I can't do anything about that past. But I can do something from here forward. We need to quit living in the past. Hey, the past is dead and gone and we can't do anything about it. I got this email yesterday. It says the year was 1955. 1955. Did you hear the post office is thinking about charging seven cents just to mail a letter? If they raise the minimum wage to a dollar, nobody will be able to hire outside help. When I first started driving, who would have thought gas would someday cost 25 cents a gallon? We'd be better off leaving the car in the garage. And did you see that some baseball player just signed a contract for $50,000 just to play ball? It wouldn't surprise me if someday they'll be making more than the president. <laughs> yeah. I never thought I'd see the day all our kitchen appliances would be electric while well, they're even making electric typewriters now. <laughs> it's too bad things are so tough nowadays. I see where a few married women are having to work outside the home just to make ends meet. It won't be long before young couples are going to have to hire somebody to watch their kids while they can both work. And I'm afraid the Volkswagen car is going to open the door of a lot of foreign business. <laughs> and there's no sense in taking short trips anymore because it takes nearly $2 a night to stay in a motel. And at $15 a day in the hospital, it's too, too expensive to get sick. That's <laughs> 1955. I wish some things were like they were in 1955, but it, it's not going to be. You hear what I'm saying? We can wish all we want to about what things used to be, but the truth is God has us right smack dab in the middle of now. And we have to learn to live now and do what we do for Christ now. We can't live in the past. Well, you've got the angels that are present, maybe not even visible. Most time to us, I suspect they're not. But they're real. Then you got the gallery of the prophets looking over the edge of heaven. And that's some of the ones that we read about over in Hebrews chapter 11. And the gallery of martyrs, those who gave up their lives 
Hey, listen, what am I talking about? I'm talking about, listen, I'm talking about us serving God. And as we serve God, we can be encouraged by looking at who is cheering us on. Remember the martyrs who were burned and, and sawn asunder and those who were crucified and, and those who were, were skinned alive. Remember what price they paid. Shouldn't that be an encouragement to you and me to joyfully serve the Lord not having to face what they faced? The gallery of martyrs, the gallery of great Christians, the one who are known as the heroes of the faith. And then think about this one. Wait. The gallery of our departed kin what if, what if, what if my grandma man can, can see over the edge of heaven? She was a sweet, dear old Christian, and my grandpa man can, sweet, older Christians that went to heaven way too soon, it seemed like to me. But they loved the Lord, and they loved the Word of God, and, uh, and they believed that the promises of God were real, and they were going to go to heaven, and they did. I think if my grandma Mankin could look over the banisters of heaven today and see me preaching, I think she'd be cheering and saying, Go, Rick, go. I knew you could do it. Go, go, go. Depend on Jesus. Keep on going. And you have some loved ones over yonder on the other side too. And you ought to keep going because they expect it of you. What if they were here in person? What if they were watching me? What if my dear departed mother died two years ago? What if she could, if the Lord would let her speak from heaven and say something? You know what I think she'd say now? She told me one time when I moved off to uh, Denver, Colorado, she said, son, I think it's an awful mistake. She said, it looks to me like you could just stay around here and preach somewhere. <laughs> you know, what if mom was here today? I think she'd say, son, wherever you preach, just make sure you preach Jesus. Just preach Jesus wherever you go. And don't give up and don't get discouraged. And don't quit. Just keep on going. And I think that's what your loved ones would say to you. Keep on going. And number three, the Christian must be encouraged. And I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Consider the witnesses. See that in, in chapter 12, verse 1? It says, Seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run the, with patience the race that is set us before us. Now look at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Jesus. Consider him. He went all the way to the cross for me. The Bible says he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. He went all the way to the cross just for me. Just for you. Don't I need to just keep on serving Him? Don't I need to stay encouraged? Don't I need to just resist any temptation to quit and to give up or to even slow down? I'm talking about serving, the God, with, serving God with joyful gladness and consider the Savior, the finisher, author and finisher, finisher of the faith. Did you notice that word finisher? 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 And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to emulate Him. He finished what do you and I need to do we need to finish we need to just keep going Jesus is right there beside of us the Bible says in Proverbs 18 24 listen to this he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother he said lo I am with you always he said he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out that sounds like a pretty good friend doesn't it huh and so if he's willing to stick with me I can't quit I can't quit I can't quit I got to keep on going and you do too. When he laid aside his royal robes of heaven and got ready to come down to earth and be born so he could live a perfect life and die on the cross, I can just imagine, now the Bible doesn't say this, I'm just pretending here a little bit, but I think it's got some validity uh, that we could find in, in, in the scriptures. I, I can just kind of imagine Jesus as he's getting ready to come to earth and the angels are getting ready to load up some chariots, royal chariots with white horses to escort him to earth to do his job. And he says, no, I won't need those horses and chariots. And he starts pulling off his robe and his angels are, are trying to tuck his royal purple robes back on him. And he says, no, you don't understand. I'm going to lay aside my robes of royalty. I'm going to earth to become one of them. I'm going to live like they live and I'm going to die in their place and pay for their sins 
and that friend is what he did I think that when he, when he left to come to be born in Bethlehem I think, I think the angels must have been shouting in heaven when they heard what he was going to do and they saw his plan I think they must have been clapping and cheering and they shouted so loud that those shepherds in the field down in Bethlehem heard them and they just started clapping and shouting too <laughs> so how do we conclude well let me say this dear sweet friend you are called to a race as a Christian you're supposed to keep on running don't slack up don't back off your church attendance. Step it up. Don't decide you can't give. Step it up. Don't come to the point where you say, there's no use witnessing to any, anybody anymore. We can't win souls anymore. Yes, we can. And we don't want to back off. We don't want to tone it down. We don't want to quiet down. We don't want to let the devil push us off in a corner and say, it's too late to do anything for this old world. It's going down the tube. We ought to yell and shout and cheer our brethren on as we witness to everybody all along the way. I'm saying we ought to be more dedicated today than we've ever been before. We've got no, we've got no time to back off. Time is short. We ought to be thinking about doing all we can as we cheer each other on. And one day, one day, it'll be time for us to depart this life. And I want to make sure, now listen, I'm closing. I want to make sure everybody in this room and everybody listening on the internet or on a recording, I want you to know that there is a Savior that you must depend upon. A lot of people think if they just turn over a new leaf and start doing better, everything will be okay, and surely God will let them into heaven. No, there is a Savior who paid a price for your sin, and you must accept Him. Some people say, well, if I just, if I just start going to church more, then everything will be okay. No, the Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. There has to be a heart transaction take place or there is no salvation. You say, well, maybe I'll just gradually become a Christian and, and finally Jesus will accept me into heaven. Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The born again experience takes place in a flash at a moment of time. The born again experience is not a series of steps that you grow into Christianity. It's when you decide in your heart that you're ready to repent, turn to Christ. You realize He paid the full price on Calvary's cross and you say, Dear God, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner just like the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you say, I know I deserve hell, but I don't want to go and I believe Jesus died in my place and I believe that He'll save me. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, salvation is not a process. It's being born again. And it's when you realize you're a sinner and you need a Savior and you ask Him right at that point in time, you say, Lord Jesus, I'm talking about being serious. I'm not talking about frivolous. There's no magic in saying a quick prayer and pretending that there's magic words that will save you. It's a heart transaction. It's when you surrender in your heart and say yes to Jesus. My wife and I stood before an official one day long ago and we said, I do. And we became man and wife that day. And that's what you have to do with Jesus. You have to say, I do. And when you say, I do, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He'll take you if you'll come to him today. Let's pray together, shall we? Our heads are bowed and eyes.